بالله من الشيطان العين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا ونبينا أبي القاسم محمد المصطفى الأمين وعلى أهل بيت الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المظلومين واللعنة الله على أعدائهم أجمعين من الآن إلى قيام يوم الدين آمين يا رب العالمين Dear respected viewers Brothers and sisters in the religion of Islam, and indeed any non-Muslim viewers who are tuning in, I greet you with the Islamic greetings of peace. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. And I'd like to welcome you back to another episode in which we continue to analyze the details of which occurred and those things which befell upon our beloved lady Fatima at Zahra alayhi salatu wassalam during the period of her martyrdom. Of course. This series is primarily interested in analyzing some of the questions which are raised about this event. It's primarily interested in how we as Shia, those of us who hold a more controversial view of Islamic history, those of us who hold a view of Islamic history which is by its very nature destined to at the very least cause some harm and offense to those who share a very different reading of Islamic history with ourselves. How are we to, number one, address those within our own flock, those of us who are within the Shia circle who have doubt in this particular historical event? And number two, how are we to understand this event from an outsider's perspective? What I mean by that is, if I'm not a Shia, I want to understand why the Shia holds and commemorates an event which is so grotesquely offensive to me. An event which is destined to, at the very, very least, rub upon some areas of friction and tension which could have maybe from the vantage point of such people been avoided. Are Shias saying these things in order to be hate preachers? Are they deliberately trying to malign, insult, offend others? Is this some reactionary, weird, spooky and booky position which has never really been held by anyone in Islamic history? Are Shias just holding on to such a belief in order to irritate us as non-Shias? These are all questions which you may find that your neighbors, your friends, your colleagues might be asking. Yesterday I took a look at the issue of how are we to look at history? Is history determined using the same filtration process that we would utilize when a Marja or Mujtahid is deriving a fiqhi ruling, a particular law, and giving it in his Rasalat al Amaliya or acting upon it? Or are we to utilize the same methodology in looking at venerations of history that we utilize in looking at jurisprudence? Of course, I concluded yesterday that when it comes to the methodology of Imamiyyah, the Ifna Ashariyah, in terms of history, this has never traditionally been their standard canon of evidence or criteria utilized in order for us to in order for us to judge whether something is authentic or inauthentic. And of course, when such a thing is understood it makes our life easier, so now we don't have to explain to some youths who may have read online that these narrations are now unauthentic and therefore we can't depend upon them. Because we understand that we now have a different canon of evidence, a different standard 
for measuring historical reports that we have for measuring jurisprudential reports and even a different standard to those for measuring reports of aqidah, measuring reports of doctrinal belief. Of course, in the same way that I would not use the same machine for filtering gold that I would use to filter a bunch of chuckies from the street, a bunch of rocks from a garden. We need to make sure that we're utilizing the same conventional standards to filter through history that we would use in any other occasion. Now, of course, yesterday we introduced how the Shia, particularly, and I quoted three prominent examples, have looked at history. I want to continue and do the same thing today but ask the question of my friends and colleagues and brothers and sisters who follow the Sunni schools of thought. How do they analyze history? Do they use this strict, stringent, and very demanding methodology of Al-Murjan? Of course, several books have been written in regards to these particular issues. One of them I have in front of me is a book published by the notorious Mubarrat al-Ali wal ashab a famous book publisher based in Kuwait, which focuses on Sunni Shia issues. Of course, it's from the Sunni side. The book is called Kayf Naqra Tariq al-Ali wal ashab by Abdul Karim bin Khalid al-Harbi. Of course, from the Harub, the Bedouins, or the Arabs of uh, the Arabs of the, uh, of the Khalij. And it has an important introduction from a Sheikh Dr. Ayad Al Qarni, in addition to a Sheikh Dr. Hatim Sh Afwan, a Sheikh Dr. Sharif Hatim Al Auni, who is, of course, a very prominent Hadith scholar in Umm Al Qura University in Mecca, one of the Salafi specialists in hadith. This book is of course written in order to teach someone who's from a particular mindset, namely a Sunni mindset, how one is to filtrate through history. Now of course what we would say about this is while such books are written these books, of course, are attempts to put a methodology onto history which were not previously utilized. And if someone wants to now use a new methodology in history, that's fine. They can call themselves as being people from the Harbi school or people from the new Auni school of history. But it doesn't mean that you're utilizing what is traditionally being recognized as the classical method of analyzing history. Of course, when we look back at certain historical reports, we find that Ahmed bin Hanbal, it is reported from him. مَا نُقِلَ an Ahmed bin Hanbal سُؤِلَ Ahmed bin Hanbal وَهُوَ عَلَى بَابَ النَّظَرِ Hashim bin al Qasim Faqila lahu Ya Aba Abdullah. This is the kunya of Ahmed bin Hanbal, Abu Abdullah. Ma taqul fi Musa bin Ubaida wa Muhammad ibn Ishaq. O oh, father of Abdullah, what do you say, O oh, Ahmed bin Hanbal, in regards to Musa bin Ubaida and Muhammad ibn Ishaq? Faqal. So Ahmed bin Hanbal, he states, Amma Musa, in regards to Musa bin Ubaidah, فَلَمْ يَكُنْ بِهِ بَأْسِ وَلَكِنْ حَدَثَ بِأَحَدِيثِ مَنَاكِيرِ and Abdullah bin Daynar. As for Musa bin Ubaidah, then, la bas, there's nothing wrong with him. Except that he reports 
Manakir, those reports which are unique, rejected from Abdullah bin Daynar. وَأَمَّا مُحَمَّدِ بْنِ إِسْحَاقِ فَالرَّجُلْ تَكْتُبُ أَنْهُ هَذِهِ الْأَحَادِيثِ يَعْنِي الْمَغَازِي As for Muhammad ibn Ishaq, then write from him the reports pertaining to Maghazi, the battles of Rasulullah, the skirmishes of Rasulullah. وَالنَّهُوهَا And the reports of her like, namely the reports of the biographies of Rasulullah. فَأَمَّا إِذَا جَاءَ الْحَلَالِ وَالْحَرَامِ أَرَدْنَا قَوْمًا هَكَذَا وَقُبِدَ أَسَابِعْ يَدَيْهِ الْأَرْبَعِ but if he reports those things which are in regards to halal and haram, then the people have dealt with it in this way. And of course, people don't take those reports from Muhammad ibn Ishaq. Another great pillar of the Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah is Yahya ibn Mu'in. Yahya ibn Ma'in, who of course needs no introduction when it comes to his standing in the Stony community as a man who filters through the reports. وَسَأَلْتَهُ أَنَا الْبَكَاءِ أَعْنِي زِيَادَةً فَقَالْ لَا بَأْسْ بِهِ فِي الْمَغَازِ as for Yahya ibn Ma'in, it was asked of him in regards to a man called Al-Baqai, namely Ziyad, in which he stated there's no problem with him in his reports pertaining to Maghazi, pertaining to the battles and skirmishes and life of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi In regards to other than that, then no. And of course, this again is an allusion to the fact that when it comes to Maghazi, when it comes to the lifetime of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi there's a particular methodology that is dealt with. Al-Bayhaqi, when he deals with a particular contradiction in reports, he states what? He states, فَهَذَا النَّوَعْ مِنَ الْمَرَاسِيلَ لا يقبل في الأحكام ويقبل this type of reports when it comes to contradiction this type of reports with a broken isnad this morsel reports which means a rushed report a report in which some of the rawat their names are omitted from the isnad it is not accepted when it comes to ahkam, jurisprudential rulings, وَيَكْبَلْ فِي مَا لَا يَتَأَلَّقْ بِهِ حُكُمْ مِنَ الدَّعْوَاتِ وَالْفَضَائِلْ عَلَى مَالْ وَالْمَغَازِ وَمَا أَشْبَهَهَ But in regards to those reports which are to do with the merits of an action, in regards to the maghazi, the skirmishes of Rasulullah, the battles of Rasulullah, the life of Rasulullah. And in regards to du'as, then there's no problem in accepting a morsel of reports. Now of course, such accounts are firm for us and are very clear and categorically clear that what we're looking at when it comes to the Sunni books of Rajal, when it comes to looking at how Sunni scholars have investigated history. Many of them, particularly their arbab of rawayat, have not particularly shown the harshest of standards when it comes to judging what is to be utilized in regards to history. That is not to say that when it comes to halal and haram, that they don't have a harsher standard. Continuing with more examples. Ibn Abdul Barr, 
was, of course, a very famous Maliki scholar. He states in Al Tamheed about a particular book. وَهُوَ كِتَاب مَشْهُورْ عِنْدَ أَحْلِ الصِّيرِ مَعْرُوفْ مَا فِيهِ عِنْدَ أَحْلِ الْعِلْمِ مَعْرُوفَ تَسْتَغْنِي بِشُهْرَتَهَا أَنَا الْإِسْنَادِ And this book is famous amongst the people of knowledge. Famous in that it's famous amongst the people of knowledge and it doesn't require an isnad. تَسْتَغْنِي بِشُهْرَتَهَا أَنَا الْإِسْنَادِ that its famousness means that the book no longer requires a sanad. لِأَنَّهُ أَشْبَحْ أَتَّوَاطِرُ فِي مَجِئِهِ لِتُلْقِيَ النَّاسِ لَهُ بِالْقَبُولِ وَالْمَعْرَفَةِ Because this book has become so famous and has close to what we would call tawatir and the people accepting it and taking from it and believing and depending on it. Ibn Taymiyyah one of the harsher, stricter scholars who is more affiliated with the Ahli Hadith today. The people of the Salafi movements, the people who take from primarily only the Hadith and would reject the speculations of jurists within the form of Ahib. The one who is famously known by them as Sheikh al-Islam. <coughs> he states, وَمِثْلْ هَذَا and like and the likes of this Mimma Yeshtahara in the Haula which has become famous to this group of people Mifla Zohri like a Zohri Wa Ibn Aqba Wa Ibn Ishaq Wal Waqadi Wal Umawi Wa Ghairahim so the likes of this, which has become famous to the group including a Zuhri, wa Ibn Aqba, wa Ibn Ashaq, wa Al-Waqadi, wa Al-Umawi, all of these historians of course, wa Ghairahim. Wa Akhtharahum ma fihi innuhum mursal, wa mursal idha ruya min jihat mukhtalifa la siyama, mimma lahu inaya bihaad al-amr, وَيَتْبَعَ لَهُ وَكَانَ كَمُسْنَدْ بَلْ بَعْضْ مَا يَشْتَهَرْ عِنْدَ أَحْلِ الْمَغَازِ وَيَسْتَطِيفْ أَقْوَى مِمَّا يَرْوِي بِالْإِسْنَادِ الْوَاحِدِ He says that such reports which become famous to the group of people we mentioned Zuhri, Ibn Ishaq, Ibn Aqba, Al-Waqadi, Al-Umawi he says a report which is acted upon and mentioned and followed by this group of people, historians, is like a fully connected chain of an isnad. And to such a degree that if it has become famous amongst the people of Maghazi, the people of this science of the seer of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, its fame with them, regardless of the isnad, would now put it into a position where we trust it more than an isolated historical report that does have an isnad. And of course, such things are definitely from those particular examples which I wanted to give you. Before we round up today's episode, for I just wanted to highlight that the demand for Sahih Asnads is not something that needs to be met when it comes to historical discussions. I wanted to quickly, just briefly before we move on, discuss the problematic nature of Islamic history and why some factors must be taken into account when looking at the issue of the door. Muhammad Ali As-Salabi one of the authors who has become popular in today's day and age, particularly those who uh, have written books about the lives of the first four rulers in Islamic history. He has a biography for Abu Bakr, a biography for Amr, a biography for Uthman. 
In his biography of Uthman, he comes to chapter 6, namely, reasons for the fitna that led to the murder of Uthman. And he names the subheading of the chapter, the importance of studying the turmoil that led up to the murder of Uthman and its consequences in the Prophet's wisdom in telling him what would happen. He goes on to state this. Allow me to just quote it. The most important events of the fitna that led up to the murder of Uthman and their consequences, such as the Battle of the Camel, Safin, etc. It was narrated that many of the Salaf and scholars enjoined refraining from indulging in detailed discussion of the things that happened among the Sahaba. So I want you to take note. This scholar is acknowledging that most scholars abstained, refrained, prohibited, stayed away from, preferred not to indulge in discussions pertaining to what happened between Sahaba when they fought one another, killed one another, and did takfir of one another. And of course, cursed one another in particular cases too. And referring their affairs to Allah, the most just judge, whilst thinking positively of them, and believing that they were in the position of mujtahids who will be rewarded, inshallah. So according to the doctrine that Dr. As-Salabi is referring to, the Sahaba may kill each other, but they'll get rewarded for doing so because according to his theology, they get one reward. We should avoid criticizing them and impugning their honor because that leads to undermining Sharia. So according to Dr. As-Salabi, to even look at history, to look amongst the early disputes, amongst the companions of a prophet means that we're undermining the Sharia, as they were its bearers who conveyed it to us. For example, it was narrated that Amr ibn Abdul Aziz, who of course is one of the uh, caliphs of Bani, Isra, uh, of Bani Umayyah, rather, was asked about the people of Safin and he said, that is blood that Allah protected us from shedding and I do not want to contaminate my tongue with it. One of them was asked about that and he responded, quoting the words of Allah, that was a nation that passed, they received the reward of what they earned and you of what you earn, and you will not be asked of what they used to do. And he goes on to state this, there is a reason for this prohibition, which is the fear that it may lead to criticism and impugning their honor, which in turn could lead to incurring the wrath and anger of Allah. But if this reason no longer applies, then it seems there is no problem with it, so long as discussing the details of what happened will not lead to criticizing them at all. In that case, there is nothing wrong with studying this matter in depth, examining its causes, motives, precise details, results and consequences for the society of Sahaba and for those who came after them. Some of the scholars, such as Ibn Kathir, At-Tabari, and others wrote about the events of that critical period in Islamic history and discussed in detail many of the issues that have to do with the fitna. Some of them even went so far as to suggest that one or both parties were wrong based on many reports and texts in which Sahih material is mixed with other kinds. There are many reasons why Ahl Sunnah and the seekers of knowledge should probe the depths with regard to the fitna that arose in the beginning of Islam and examine its details. These reasons include the following. So he's rebuking the previous stance of not looking into history. Number one, contemporary writers who deal with the turmoil that occurred amongst the Sahaba fall into three groups. Number one, books written by authors who the product of a Western way of thinking that is hostile towards Islamic history or is ignorant of Islamic history and does not see any good in it. So they carried on criticizing the Sahaba and the Tabi'in. And he gives examples such as Taha Hussein in his book Al-Fitnat Al-Kubra. And he also gives the example of Rafavis in this particular case and gives the example of books such as Abi Mikhnaf in the book of Nasr bin Muzahim and says that because these books were written by Rafavis, like the book of Yaqubi, we can't depend upon it at all. Then he goes on to say, interestingly enough, 
this plot will become apparent to anyone who studies Al Awasim Min Al Qawasim of Ibn Al Arabi. Abu Bakr ibn al Arabi, the same man who said that Hussein alayhi salatu was, was killed by the sword of his own grandfather. MashaAllah, this is the choice given by Dr. Salabi. And he goes on to attack the Shia. Then in category two, he says books written by some of the contemporary scholars of this ummah, these are useful in general, but the way in which they discuss and interpret the attitude of some of the Sahaba and Tabi'een is in many or some cases unfair. Why? He says such as that which was written by Abu al-Ala al-Mawdudi in al khilafa al-Mulk and those written by Sheikh Muhammad Abu Zahra in Tariq al-Umam al-Islami and by, Maha and by Imam Zaid ibn Ali. These two books are filled with much that undermines the position of the Sahaba and criticizes the caliphs of Bani Umayyah condemning them and denying that they had any good qualities or did any righteous deeds. It seems that scholars such as these did not examine the historical reports, rather they adopted wrath of the Shi'i reports and based their analysis and conclusions on them. May Allah forgive them and us. Now, of course, this is again, so first category, blame Western Orientalists and we'll blame the Shia. Sec second category, Good intentions, but no, no criticizing Sahaba will blame the Shia again. C. Books whose authors tried to follow the methods of a jarhi wa ta'adil, namely al marjan in examining historical reports and subjecting them to the methods of the Hadith scholars. So he mentions several books such as a Dr. Yusuf al Ash, Muhibb al Din al Khatib, Abu Bakr ibn al Arabi and others like Sulaiman al-Awda, others like Akram al-Amari, and people like Uthman al-Khamis. Now, of course, such scholars are utilizing a methodology that was never utilized previously. <clears throat> but nonetheless, it's interesting to see this methodology in which any historian who has the slightest critique of the Sahaba is placed into one of two camps by Dr. Salabi. Namely, they're biased and they can't be accepted. Just before we move on to the end of the show, I would like to quote quickly from another work in which Dr. Muhammad Ali al Salabi, Dr. Muhammad Ali al Salabi, has contributed. Namely, as Sahih wa Da'if. Min Tariq at Tabari. He's taken the book The History of Tabari and he's tried to grade it according to the methodology of Jarhi wa Ta'adil, namely Ilm Rajal. Of course, what's important to note here is something which I want you all to pay very close attention to. This is found in Volume 8, the introduction to Volume 8, in which it's made clear that because these volumes discuss the period of the Caliphs after the death of the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, there are certain sensitive key topics that must be discussed. Now, of course, when it comes to the historians, they want to ensure that they filtrate several of the things that have gotten into the books of history. Of course, the claim is that this is being done using Al Murajal. Is that the case? He states on page 7 of his introduction Wa in the Tariq al Tabari, Min Ausa Masadr al Tariqi al Mutakadama wa Akhtaraha, it tana and bil Isnad. Illa in the Tabari, Rahimahullah. اعتمد في تاريخ حروب الردة وفتوح الشام والعراق ومجريات الأحداث في هذه الأحد في هذا الأحد عفوا أحد الخلفاء الراشدين على مرويات سيف بن عمر التميمي وبكثرة. تاريخ الطبري is one of the most important books except that when it comes to the issue of the apostasy wars, the expansion of Islam and the events which occurred in this time period. 
At-Tabari depends heavily upon the reports of Saif ibn Amr at-Tamimi and in abundance. وَكَذَلِكْ أَتَّمَدْ مَرْوِيَاتْ أَبِي مِخْنَفْ And in addition to that, he, determ- he depends upon the reports of Abi Mikhnaf. وَمَعْلُوم إِنَّ عِمَّ جَرْحِ وَالتَّعَدِيلِ أَجْمُؤُ عَلَى تَعْضْعِيفِ أَبِي مِخْنَفْ And it's well known that the scholars of Jarhi wa Ta'adil, Ibn al-Rujal, gathered and unanimously agreed upon the weakening of Abi Mikhnaf according to this particular offer. Now, he goes on to say, وَبَيْنَ مَا فِي مَتُونَهَا مِنْ نَكَارَ وَلَمْ نَجِدْ لَهُ إِلَّا رَوَايَةْ قَلِيلَ جِدًّا تُوَافِكْ مَا رَوَاهُ الثقات وَلَمْ تُظِلْ كَثِيرٌ فِي نَقْتِ رَوَايَتِهِ فَقَدْ كَفَانَا أُسْتَاذِ يَحْيَى الْيَحْيَى يَحْيَى الْيَحْيَى One of the researchers who depended upon this book فِي كِتَابِهِ القيم Not this book, sorry, in a different book فِي كِتَابِهِ القيم In his important work مَرْوِيَاتَ بِمِخْنَ فِي تَارِخَ طَبْرِ أَسْرُ الْخُلَفَاءَ الرَّاشِدِينَ دِرَاسَ نَقْدِيَ this is not too important. I wanted to just quote the part about Saif ibn Amr al-Tamimi. Abi Mikhnaf is not concerned, is not someone that we are concerned with at this particular moment. But he goes on to say this. However, in regards to the reports of Saif ibn Amr al-Tamimi, وَهُوَ الْأَكْثَرْ وَرُودًا فِي أَحَدْ أَبِي بَكْرِ الصَّدِيقِ in the Tabari. And he's the one that mentions and narrates the most about the time period of Abu Bakr in Tabari's historical work. فَقَدْ وَذَعْنَا مَنْهَجًا نَرْجُوا إِنَّ قَدْ أَلْتَزَمْنَا بِهِ فِي تَحْقِيقَنَا هَذَا We have depended upon a solid methodology which we hope we have fully held on to in our research and conclusions of the Rawayat of Tariq al-Tabari. وَقَبْلْ ذِكَرْ شُرُوطَنَا فِي تَفَاصِيلْ مَا مَرْوِيَاتْ سَيْفْ And before mentioning our conditions with elaborate detail in the reports of Sayf ibn Amr al-Tamimi لَا بُدَّ النَّفْقَرْ أَقْوَالَ الْأُلَمَا فِيهِ بِالْإِخْتِصَارِ So he mentions the, what the ulama of the Sunnis have stated in regards to Sayf ibn Amr al-Tamimi but what is most important now are the conditions which this particular scholar has utilized in filtering these reports. He goes on to state, وَيَرَى الْمُؤَرَّخَ الْإِسْلَامِ الْمَآصِرُ أُسْتَاذَ الْعَمَرِ إِنَّ الصَّيْفِ هَذَا ضَعِيفَ جِدًّا فِي التَّارِيخِ قُلْنَا مِنْ أَجْلْ مَا سَبَقْ وَذَعْنَا بَعْضًا مِنْ رَوَايَاتِ سَيْفِ فِي قِسْمِ الصَّحِيحِ بِالشُّرُوط Despite the fact that so many of the ulama have weakened Saif ibn Amr al-Tamimi, we have come up with conditions for placing some of the reports of Saif in the authentic reports of Tabari. What are they? Number one. In wajadna laha aslan sahihan ibtida'an bil-Bukhari wa maruran bi baqiyat kutub al-Hadith wa intaha'an bi masadir tarikhi al-Mawthuqa. But number one, we would find such a report in a book of hadith like Bukhari and other books of hadith. And if that fails, we'll find it in a reliable book of history. Number two. And ta'aqadna min khalu tilka ruwayat mimma yata'allaq bi masail al-aqidiyah wal-halali wal-haram. But we would make sure that such reports are free of those things which are pertaining to jurisprudential rulings and theological beliefs. Number three. That we would make sure and ensure that these reports do not in any way, shape, or form cast doubt 
in the doctrine of Adalat al Sahaba and that more importantly that they would not put any doubts or cast into a negative light their dealings with one another as Sahaba. Of course, it is this third condition which is problematic. Why? Isn't the methodology that is being utilized in analyzing these reports the methodology of the Senate? Why are we now looking at which of these reports, which comes from this individual, do not place a bad light upon the Sahaba? Isn't this a whitewashing of history? Isn't this a bias? Of course, we have gone way over the intended time, dear viewers, and so we'll return to this in the next episode, insha'Allah ta'ala. Hada wa sallallahu ala sayyidina Muhammadin wa ahla bayta al-tayyibin al-tahirin.